Heat of the Moment by Asia, featuring the fretwork of Steve Howe, British guitarist best known for his work with, yes, Asia, and a couple of other bands you may or may not have heard of. He was invited into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2017 and remains, for many, one of the great guitarists of his generation. He's written his book, All My Yesterdays, telling his story in his own words for the first time with unflinching honesty and humour. Delighted to be joining us live on the line from the UK, uh, the one on the only Steve House. Steve, good afternoon to you. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, Charles. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. In that song, it said, now you find yourself in 82, and now we find ourselves in 2020. How does 2020 find you, Steve? <laughs> well, you know, at the moment, under the circumstances, uh, as good as one can expect, yeah. I mean, you know, being, you know, careful and, and uh, protecting ourselves as much as we can, and uh, just trying to get through this uh, big, big change in the world. And you've decided to put this all, your your life history down in this book, All My Yesterdays. How did it begin, Steve? What were your original influences? Because you st- you, you've played with some of the, the greatest bands who've had the biggest influence from the, basically the 60s and the 70s onwards. Well, I mean, I was, um, there, was, there was a time in the, about 2009, so just over 10 years ago, I, um, I was lucky enough to be staying in Switzerland in a chalet, and I suddenly found I had three weeks... I didn't have really, hadn't really given myself a schedule, so I sat down and I just started writing about my early years, you know. And I thought, well, this could be something. And I actually got to about fifteen thousand words in three weeks. But then a long delay happened, you know, and I rushed on with my life with uh, with my family and, and with yes, and, and going in and out of different projects. And you know, at the time I was also in Asia, and we were running two bands at once, and it was all kind of exciting. But um, then I decided that until I met the people that like, responded uh, to uh, a publishing uh, idea and I found the right sort of people who were not only selling books in shops but also selling on the internet, etc. So I met up with Omnibus Books and that's when it kind of clicked. So then about three or four years ago, uh, I guess in the mid-2000 uh, teens, I um, I started to put months back back work into it, and it became my uh, central secret project, so I could uh, get it finished last year. Your secret project. What was it about the guitar then? Did you have a guitar thrust into you for an early age? Was your family musical, or was it sort of a Hank Williams turned you on, or the Burt Wielden songbook? What was it? Uh, it was really like this. My parents did have a lot of guitar music in their collection of 78s, you know, uh, Les Paul and Mary Ford, and also a guy called Tennessee Ernie Ford, who had great guitar duo called Speedy West and Jimmy Bryant on his records. So I heard this stuff, and I was, I was about 10, and I started to like react to it, and I said, hey, I'd like a guitar. They said, no way. So I was 11, and I said, I like a guitar, and they kind of said, no way. And then I got to 12, and they said, well, if you've been asking this long, we'll get you one. So we went, my dad and I went and bought a cello guitar, an archstock cello guitar, a bit like a jazzy-looking guitar. And, um, you know, that's where it started. And after a couple of years, I got an electric guitar, and I was in a band, and I started being, you know, in bands, pretty much. But then I heard Chad Atkins, and after all the guitarists I'd been exploring... Uh, you know, in jazz field, classical field, and pop and rock and all that kind of thing. There were so many great guitarists, but when I heard Ted Atkins, I just kind of went, no, this is the guy, this is the guy. So that's where I got the country picking that I use on Clap and a lot of my solo pieces and, you know, features on the S album, like in uh, Disillusion, there's a kind of country picking along with Clap. So Chet was a big influence, but he was a very colourful, very versatile guitarist, and that's what I wanted to be. And what was the scene like then? How did you, because you didn't spring from the bit of doing a bit of Chet Atkins into, into Yes. I mean, did you get involved in the in the 60s scene? I mean, you were originally a Londoner. Did you get involved in that whole R&B club scene that we hear so much about in London? Yeah, I mean, if you work through, from my first record, 64, there was a group called The Syndicates. We were produced by Joe Meek, who was a big pop producer, you know, and quite powerful. We did a few records with him, they didn't really take off. And then I left and joined the in crowd. Now, they just had a bit of a chart success with an Otis Redding called that song called That's How Slow My Love Is with Keith West and singing. So I joined that band about 66. Then we turned into Tomorrow, which is a psychedelic band, which is very, very successful. And we toured with, did shows with... Uh, Pink Floyd and, you know, Vanilla Fudge and Traffic and all that kind of thing. So we were immersed in the psychedelia of the world. Had a bit of a lull then at 68, 69, leaving tomorrow and forming a sort of songwriting group. group. Yeah, I was really determined I wanted to play my own music. So um, 
1970, you know, I, I, I came to see got the call from Chris, and he said that John and him had seen me playing, and they, they thought uh, I'd fit in the band. So they were right, and I was uh, very happy to join. And what was the what was the creative process like with yeah? Did you all bring b- different bits to to the recording sessions or to the rehearsal sessions? I mean, did you did you go off and work on some of the the finger picking yourself and then come and find out what the rest of the band had been up to? Well, the yes album was constructed in a fairly I- idyllic sort of way. We went to the country and we we just started writing songs together, and they were collaborative. And John had some songs, and then Chris had a bit. And you know, like Starship Cooper demonstrates, you know, the first pass by John Anderson, the second pass by Chris Squire, a shorter part, but very exciting. And then I wrote one. So we kind of put those things together, and that's what Yuri you Knows Grace was like. Um, and it varied on the first album, but by the time we, John and I started collaborating, we were round about. So when Fragile came out, it started the Anderson House or the songwriting team that did then Close to the Edge, Tales from Telegraph Oceans, Awaken, and all those kind of things. So we did kind of steer it a little bit, but the other guys were very integral, and the arranging in Yes was the main key to it. So we just you know, it was, it was useful to have songwriting teams, and, and John had written with Chris, Chris before, but then in the 70s, he wrote quite a lot with me, which obviously Tales demonstrates quite a lot too. But Close to the Edge was our real breakthrough. I mean, Roundabout did the a lot of good, but Close to the Edge established it as this band that we're going to take on new new goals, you know, 20-minute piece, you know, called Close to the Edge. It was quite new, and uh, we loved it. Do you think that, uh, that, that what you were doing, prog rock, prog rock, has, has got a bit of a bad rap? I know that I did an interview with somebody who'd written a history of prog rock a bit earlier in this year, and they're saying that it's you know it's coming back because the the standards of music ship, and you were pushing the envelope as far as technology and what you could do with the instrumentation that you had. That's exactly right. We had a, we had a broad imagination, and you know, if we wanted a church organ, we'd go in a church and we go to church organ. You know, if we wanted a mellotron, you know, we'd Somebody built one and we blowed it, you know, and mini mogs and mogs. And, so we were very adventurous. But what I contributed mainly was the versatile guitar approach. Instead of just like, you know, which was traditional in the 60s, really, you know, and, and I don't disrespect the guys who had like one sound. But what I was into was being a multi-guitar player who also featured acoustic guitars because I could really get something out of those instruments. So that's what the... That's what the opportunity gave me. Well, while while the keyboard players, you know, were were dabbling in all this new world of keyboards, I was kind of stretching my limits by, you know, playing acoustics, twelve strings, electrics, guitar guitars, and just steel guitars. I mean, the steel guitar came way back from my early influence before I started playing, and I, I really love playing the steel guitar and the pedal steel, which is a bit more of a chordal and more complicated instrument. But the steel became like in going for the one, you know. It <laughs> this, is a rock, this is where I could rock out, you know. And so, yeah, I mean, I was doing that, and the other guys were doing what they were doing, and it was really just such a high collaboration level uh, that we uh, we had a lot of freedom from Atlantic, and, um, you know, so we were in the right place. What was it like? Was, the stuff about the way that prog can be perceived it obviously, you know, I mean, we didn't bother letting it, it irritate us, you know, because, you know, in one birth we were the people's band in the, the, the middle to late 70s, and then we were like rock dinosaurs because, you know, punk came along and everybody was in their, in their bedrooms strumming three chords. But we, we, we believed in what we, what we still do, believe in what we do, and there's room for a music called, that they're now called prog, but... You know, uh, there is some stigma, but we don't we don't latch onto it. You know, we're basically proud of what we do, and we let we let people ride. What was it like taking um, and touring with Yes? What were what were the live gigs like, and and, and the road life like with Yes? Well, that's a pretty huge <laughs> question. I've been on the road for about sixty years, um, so Yes is part of it. Yeah, when it started, it was like other bands I've known. You know, but except we went to America. And then we got America going kind of rapidly, really, which was nice. But, you know, then it got very, in the mid-70s, we were very successful. We had private jet and you know, limousines. And I said, I don't like limousines. I, I don't like them. So by the 80s, I bought a car in America, and obviously I had a car in Europe, in England. But basically, I did my tours in cars 
from then on, and I've done that as much as I can. So the thing I didn't like was the, the mode of transport being claimed. I got tired of that. But the other thing was that we, we had the luxury of staying at nice hotels, but you never spent very long in them. You know, sometimes you you go to it after the show, have breakfast in the morning and leave. I mean, what's the point in having a, an expensive hotel to do that in? But we, we did at times. And um, basically, we were very fortunate to be successful and be able to spend <laughs> some of our profits on, on some fairly uh, good things that, that made us feel comfortable at the time. Um, you know, other people were more tight with their bank balances, but, you know, we did we did have some pleasures allowed us. And, um, you know, that's the way things go. You mix and match, you know, when times are good, yeah, maybe you'll do something. But we wouldn't ever go back to the sort the level of extravagance that within the 70s just because, um, well, eight private jets are the most consuming and uh, wasteful uh, machines in the world, even though they are beautiful. <laughs> but there are other ways to make sense of, I mean, yes, has always been a working band and therefore we, you know, we're not all retiring with, with big pensions. We're actually a hard-working band and that, that's been the drive of, of, the, uh, of the stimulus of the band is that you have to come in here you have to prove yourself, and you have to play uh, on stage extremely well, you know, at an orchestral sort of level. So that's the challenge. To be in one big band, you know, one huge successful band would be good enough, and yes, was that. And then I introduced you by playing uh, by playing Asia, and, that, that, you know, heat of the moment, number one smash across uh, across everywhere, basically. You play that track, and people remember that lyric, and here we are in 82. What was, what was that like? Well, yeah, I came out of, of Yes, uh, 81, and then, you know, I met up with John Wetton, and we had a jam for a couple of days in a rehearsal room, and then we said, well, why don't we have a band together? So by 82, we've got Carl Palmer, and we've got Jeff Downs from the Buggles and the Yes drama period. So he joined us, and the four of us were just a, a you know, a, a very exciting proposition. And, you know, of course, the tag and the super band, super group and all this but basically, um, we were recording the album. The last song that was added was Heat of the Moment. And I tracked up seven guitars all playing the same things, each one in a different amplifier. And some of them blew up while I was recording. And basically, we had a very powerful guitar front on that song. And of course, John Merton was proving himself to be, you know, Asia's main songwriter and things. So Asia wasn't so much of a songwriting thing. You know, I had some songs, you know, on various albums. But, you know, I, I loved being a guitarist. And as you said, the nicest twist for me was that I was sort of proving that, that give me another lineup and we can still be successful. And Steve Hackett and I continued that then in the middle of the 80s with GTR. And that was very successful, you know, for one album. So Asia was a very short-lived thing because it was so successful that we... We kind of lost the plot, you know. By the second album, we'd lost the plot a little bit. There wasn't this mix of prog and, and that so much in the second album. So I reckon we, we fell apart, partly because of that, and they moved on and I moved on. And, you know, then I had ABWH, which was, uh, you know, a really successful version of the S with it without the wonderful Chris Squire yeah. and the other uh, members of the 80s lineup. So basically... I was very lucky, but the, the unlucky thing about it was that they were all very short projects. Asia, GTR, ABWH, and even the Yes Union. It was very kind of short stabs of success, considering we had 10 years with Yes, even though there were lineup changes. Uh, it was a very consistent period of making you know, outlandishly uh, good records. Outlandishly good records. I like that. One of the things that strikes me, and, you know, I love that this period of, of, of rock history, as we may now call it, is is the way that, you know, people change into bands and go back and forth, and you think about, you know, Blackmore and Rainbow and all the purple and all that sort of stuff. Um, and in your book, you talk about jamming with other musicians, and, and it strikes me that that's what we don't get anymore. We don't get people sitting down and jamming. I mean, you talk about jamming with Hendrix, for example, in the book. Don't tell me I've just lost through my... Would you believe it? Ladies and gentlemen, one of the rock gods has... L I've just lost connection with him uh, on, the, on my killer question. So I'm going to take a deep cleansing breath, swear very loudly, and play some yes. The man himself is back on the line. Uh, where, where, where were we, Steve? <laughs> well, well, I've just, I just given you a whole kind of rundown of how the short yeah. groups of the 80s were... Very, very successful, but we just couldn't hold it all together. And I was just... 
they covered a little bit of that. I was just saying that the fact that one of the things I love about this period of history is everybody was seen to be jamming with each other. If you look at the you know people drumming, you know, people drumming with various bands, you know, Blackmore with Rainbow and Purple and all that sort of thing. And and in the early days of your career, you were sort of jamming with with Hendrix, for example. And and musicians don't seem to do that sort of thing that jam with each other so much. Uh, well, look, opportunities have come along. I mean, you, you know, you don't know they're coming, uh, and you, you, you know, you, you enjoy them when they're there. You can't kind of search them out, really. And um, I would say that you know, playing on the Queen Innuendo record was fantastic. You know, I did uh, various sessions uh, more in the sixties when I was unknown, but obviously some of the some of the uh, guesting that I did uh, at other times. I haven't really amounted to much, but uh, it's not my primal focus. You know, I'm not really a session guitarist. I, I'm a band player, you know, mm. or a solo artist, which I also, <laughs> which is partly what grew, you know, after making a few albums, in two albums in the 70s, and then I made some more in the in the 80s. That's the craft underneath this story I was learning, which is also covered in, in my book, you know, because that is very central solo guitar work in the Chet Atkins and classical style, but also group writing, I mean, songwriting and instrumentals. You know, I mean, they don't get a chance to play that many instrumentals in groups. So my solo career is fairly littered with them. You know, albums like Spectrum and um, Quantum Guitar, you know, I mean, pure instrumental. And um, that also, you know, is part of my fun. I'm very fortunate to be able to play bands and do solo. Of course, you haven't you haven't thrown in the towel just yet. You've been working on a new album, I believe. Yeah, along with the book, we've got a new album that's coming out in in July now on BMG, and it's called Love Is. And uh, I'm very very excited. It's a it's a balance, uh, a fifty fifty balance of instrumental tracks. There's five, and then there's five uh, vocal tracks as well. And actually, they've all got Dylan Howe on the drums, who is amazing. And also they have, on the songs, John Davison from Yes is playing bass and also doing the harmonies on those particular songs. So, yeah, I mean, there's a nice leaf in that, and that, that's, uh, that's part of the end story of uh, All My Yesterdays, is, is how I take a... I wanted to take a fair bit of time, a relaxed time, over this album, and, uh, you know, it, 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 I was very busy during the 2010-2020 era anyway, but I still got this record and the book done you know, before all this uh, drama and change in the world started. So it was nice that I got it pretty much both days wrapped up uh, last year. So I'm very excited. And what's it like? What's it like to revisit those and, and flick through the pictures? And because there's some photographs in there that you know the world, the general world hasn't seen thus far. Is it good to go back and, and remember? Because you can, you know, unlike others, you can remember what you were doing at that point. Yeah, yeah, of course it is. Yeah, I mean, I don't need to dwell on it. I mean, in a way, the book kind of was a sort of exercise also. It got it, got it all out of me, and it got it all on paper. And um, so I just thought, it's an autobiography. I, I wrote it myself on, on my Mac, and um, basically, so I had that total freedom. And telling that story um, was, was fascinating, you know, aided with some diaries and calendars and notes later on in the last 20 years, particularly. But basically, some of it was done to open memory, of course, because I didn't have a lot of references for, uh, you know, 60s and 70s. I had some. But um, basically, it, it, it's like an exercise. Like I said, you get it out of your system and you do it. And now I'm sort of accountable for anything I've said in here. So, um, I, I, you know, I, there was the purpose, as I explained, was, was to explore this career. It's 70 years. Basically, this book covers 70 years. Uh, in a way, as much as Love Is, the album, it also kind of covers 70 years as <laughs> well, because it's, uh, you know, I made 12 solo albums. But if you include my homebrew series, this is my 19th album that's entitled Steve Howe Something, you know. So basically, I've um, enjoyed producing, I've enjoyed writing, but mostly I enjoy recording. So the guitar still has, I'm amazed, it still has, I still listen to Chet, Wes Montgomery, you know, the other great players, you know, John Williams on the guitar, Gene Green, um, you know, Jerry, you know, Jerry Douglas on the dobo, you know, there's so many guitarists to enjoy, Flavio Sala, a classical guitarist from Italy, Martin Taylor from Scotland, it's an international thing, Steve Morse from America. You know, I, I enjoy an immense amount of guitarists, so um, it's hard to single any of them out because they all had an influence, I guess, somewhere. I'm not really sure how, 
but I think they have. But uh, occasionally I meet people who say, oh, you've had an influence on me. So that's, that's a nice kickback. And of course, you said before, you mentioned that beautiful word craft. And, and that's the thing with guitar, because you never really get it. You're always learning with guitar. It's always a craft. There's always something. And, and you, rather than going for the power chords, have developed that craft, Steve. Yeah, I guess parts, you know, George Harrison was a great influence because, because you know, the Beatles, uh, I mean, some of the parts were, were read by Paul McCartney, but um, I gave him some credit where it's due. But a lot of the substantial guitar parts and guitar ideas that George had were, were in highly influential. So the guitarist had a role. As Paul said to George in Let It Be film, you know, have you got any riffs? So guitarists expect to have riffs, you know, a bit groove, a bit of a groove, you know. And uh, I do that, you know, uh, and I like I like to write structure as well. I don't always want to write song, you know. But I, when I get song now, I, I tend to write a lot of word stuff and then I sort it out later and see where it fits in some new tunes. So, I mean, I'm still, with music, what's exciting, in fact, is that music's never really made the same again. I mean, I've never written a song like I wrote Clap, you know. I mean, I sat down, I put all together my ideas that I had from the, the inspiration that I got from Chad Atkins and put them all in a, in a new tune. Um, Mood for a Day was, was quite romantic, you know, and I've met my wonderful wife, who, who's still married, Janet, and basically, uh, you know, we had a family, so we were starting a family then. So the family is something we haven't mentioned, but, you know, it's very important to me. I'm a family person, I like to be, and I like to, you know, like get a chance to communicate with, with these, uh, you know, with the growing family. Now we've got grand, grandkids as well. The book... The book is called All My Yesterdays. It's coming out on the 16th of April. It's by Omnibus Press. And the album is due for release. Is it out this month or is it being put back a bit by... It's been put, put down to July now. Right. We've just been discussing that. And that, that we're, we're building our plans and campaign for, for July. Do you, do you think you might go on tour with it or are you just waiting to see what happens with the current situation? Well, the current situation, yeah, it, it does limit planning. And touring needs advanced planning, but... You know, we're going to do our best. Um, you know, yes, we'll definitely be over in Europe next year this time when we've moved our whole European tour across. And um, so basically, um, of course, I love the road. You know, I'm a performer, more, most probably more than all the other things. I'm a producer, writer, player. But performing is, is a mix of all those things where you bring your music into the stage and where they are, you're looking at the, you can see the colour of your eyes. So basically, that is a very exciting part of it. One of the stimulus is to keep going, you know, and uh, enjoy not only constructing and writing music, but also performing it. That's, that's like the icing on the cake, the cherry on the cake. The icing on the cherry on the cake. We hope to catch you in Europe next year. This book is called All My Yesterdays. It's out on the 16th of April. Go forth and get yourself a copy, listeners. It was available on all the usual search engines, etc., etc. Steve, do you do do you do the social media thing? Can they find you uh, on the internet thingy? Oh yeah, there's plenty of stuff going on. I mean, I, I do it arm's length, but I, I see the posts and the people were very kind yesterday. The other day when it was my birthday, I got loads of posts. And, and we've answered them today, I believe. And basically, we're 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 in touch with that. And obviously, now is a great time to do it. There's a little bit more time to well, not a little, but a lot more time to devote to it because it's a very important connection. And, and that's what we hope to do in the near future: is is you know uh, live by live by my words and, and get on with that a bit more because it's a nice way of communicating. Well, I'm going to play clap before the end of the show, but I've got something else lined up now. But it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. This book is called All My Yesterdays. Go and find the album Love Is. Steve Howe, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you today. Thanks very much. Thanks very, very much. <laughs> Thanks, Charles.